Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise his name. We just close your eyes and raise your hands and love the Lord right now. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I praise your name, God. I worship you, Jesus. Lord, I ask you to have your way in these next few moments among us. Lord, let your Holy Spirit have free course in this house. You know, the many that have come tonight, God, hurting, wounded, bound, perhaps they're in the struggle of their life, God, but you are the peace speaker. So we peace, we speak peace right now in the name of Jesus. We speak God healing right now in the name of Jesus. We speak hope, God, right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Certainly good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And my father would say, I would rather be here than the finest hospital in town. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Bishop, for the opportunity to preach. I am sorry it comes at the expense of your health, but I just am so glad to be able to minister behind the sacred desk, the word of life. And uh, I have some guests with me tonight. I have uh, Dennis back there and Randy. I saw him over here somewhere. And somewhere Sean or Joshua's in the house, thankful for him. And we're just glad to be here. Turn to somebody and let them know I'm happy you're here. I'm happy you're here. I'm happy you're here. And hey, we'd have a hard time having church tonight if nobody showed up. Amen. Now, we say having church, but we are the church. Uh, we're the church whether we're gathered in this place or gathered at Shoney's. Well, nobody goes to Shoney's no more, but... If we're, wherever we're gathered at, the Bible says whether two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. Amen. And if you've been baptized in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus, and filled with the Holy Ghost, you're a part of the church of the living God. And so right now as a church, let's just praise God and thank him that we've been born again. I thank you, Jesus. I'm a part of the church of the living God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Turn your Bibles tonight to Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. And then just one scripture, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And I take for a topic tonight this subject, religious but lost. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. Then Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Praise God. Praise God. Religious, but lost. Oh, Jesus, 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 there's something about that name. His master, Savior, Like a fragrance after, after the, rain. the rain. Oh, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Oh, 
shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. One more time. Oh, Jesus, 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 there's something about. God, you may be seated tonight in the presence of the Lord. He is walking along a path one day. and He turns to inspect something he has noticed for some time, but never investigates it. He is looking at a bush that's burning, but not consumed. Uh, if you read the text, it appears to look like Moses had seen this bush burning for some time. But for some reason, on this particular day, he decides, I'm going to look at this bush. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm out in the woods and I'm seeing a bush burning that's not being consumed, I'm going to check it out right now. Oh, yeah. But for some reason, Moses waited to go look and see. And then he walks into that holy place yes and there he meets god and god tells him take your shoes off moses for the place you're staying on right now it's holy ground and we are right now standing in the holy presence of god and this place is holy ground this house has been consecrated to the god of heaven this is the place where righteous things occur and the people of God come to worship the mighty name of Jesus and they give their hearts and their lives to Him and their lives are changed to what we call an altar where they come and repent of their sins and they make changes in their life. And so as such, we should never come here and desecrate this holy place. This is a holy place. When we come here and pray, all times of the day at times, we walk in this place. I'm not the only one. Several that come and pray at different times have told me it's such a holy place. Yes. I feel the presence of God yes. in this place. Uh, it, it's a clean place. Yes. It's a clean place. As far as we know, no perverse or wicked thing has ever happened in this place place dedicated to God so Moses is told take off your shoes Moses you're standing on holy ground and here God calls Moses to become the deliverer of the children of Israel here he commissions him with a great commission to go and to tell that Pharaoh let my people Go, so they will serve me. They are spending their time in Egypt, you see. They were there, having spent 400 years there. Joseph had that great interpretation of the dream of seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. I got it reversed. Seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And what he did was he 
put all of the feel, all the meat and all, all the meal that was grown and put it into storage places. And he was able to save that nation out of great calamity and all other peoples that came there as well because they had stored up. But the Bible says that there arose over that 400 years since then, there arose a Pharaoh that did not know about Joseph. Sometimes people forget through whatever reason, and for whatever reason, what God has done in their lives and the lives of those around them. I've come to tell you tonight, do not forget what God has brought you from. Do not forget the place that he pulled you up out of. He pulled me out. We used to sing a song, he set my feet on a rock to stay. And we sing a song of praise. Hallelujah, because he pulled me up out of the miry clay. And so here God introduces us to this exodus. This exodus exiting this land of sin, the land of Egypt, and going towards a land of promise. It was in this journey when he finally, finally, Pharaoh, after ten plagues, says, Get out of here, Moses. Take the people with you. And two to seven million people, depending upon what writer you want to listen to, they say they left the land of Egypt. I don't know if it was two million. I don't know if it was seven million. All I know is two million is a lot of people. And they left the land of Egypt. No wonder Pharaoh was worried. He was worried that if these people decided one day they're going to take the nation in their own hand, they would rise up and foment a rebellion. And so he imprisoned them in what we call slavery. Listen, the devil wants to enslave you because he knows if you ever get an identity of who you are and how powerful you are together, there is no weapon formed against you that will prosper. There is no enemy that can come against you that can destroy you. And God will give you the victory. If you know how to work together. So they go there. They go to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, God makes this fledgling group of people, fledgling, there are two million, but he turns them into just a bunch of tribes, into a nation. We call it the nation of Israel because he gives them the law there, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in the midst of that, there in Exodus chapter 20, he gives us 10 commandments where he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God hath given thee. That's the only one with promise, by the way. You want to live a long life? Treat your mama and your daddy right. If you want a short life, don't. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. And these Ten Commandments given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai begin with this covenantal promise that you are going to have no gods before you. There's only one God tonight. His name is Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh. And Jehovah God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New. Make no bones about it. There's only one God. We serve one Lord and we have one faith and one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and in all and through you all. One God! And we're in covenant with that one God. Just like them children of Israel were in covenant with one God. There's not two gods, three gods, four gods. There's only one God. And the Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Moses, he took them on a wilderness journey for 40 years because they listened to an evil report, the Bible says. Listen, the Bible says an evil report will defile many. Be careful who you're listening to. Be careful what you're listening to. Because an evil report can get into your heart and your mind through your ears. You hear it and you receive it. You dwell upon it and then it begins to defile you from the inside out. And when you're defiled, you begin to defile other people. 
And so these ten spies, there were two that were not defiled. Thank God for Caleb and Joshua. But these other ten, whose names we don't really talk about much, I, I, they're in there in the Bible, but they really don't make much of a difference because they, they listened to the evil report. They got defiled on their own selves, and they defiled an entire nation of people to not walk into the promise that God had for them. Be careful that you don't listen to negative people. We're in the midst of growth right here at Life Cathedral. We're in the midst of great revival. Let your words be spoken positive. Amen? Talk about how good God is. Because God is good. I don't have to make up stories about how, God good, how God, good God is. God is wonderful. He's great. He's a healer. He's a sanctifier. He's a deliverer. He raises people from the dead. He lifts people from their falls. I don't got to make that up. He does that all the time. Every day, the Lord is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. So Moses introduced Israel to God as Savior. God who would exit them out of bondage, out of slavery, out of whatever was degrading them and beating them down, and he became their Savior. Much like we today, the Bible lets us know that God called us out of darkness. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light, which in time past were not a people. We didn't have access to this thing, but now we are the people of God. We have not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. I'm so glad tonight for the mercy of God. I never deserved His mercy. How about you? And yet He gives us mercies. It's of the Lord's mercies. They fail not, the Bible says. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Every day His mercies are renewed every day. And so Israel, they rejoiced in this identity that they were the children of God. They were the promise of God. They were God's chosen people. But in time, they lost something. They lost sight. They took pride in their identity as God's chosen people. Their identity as a covenantal people. They had the covenant. It started with Abraham when God said, you do this, Abraham, the the circumcision situation will put you in the covenant with me. And they continued the covenant with the law. And so they were God's covenant people. He was God's chosen people. But in spite of all that, they forgot about something that was key to covenant. And that is, there is no real covenant without relationship with God. So then we have Jeremiah, 800 years later, from Moses time of the exodus to Jeremiah's day, these Israelites had turned away from Jehovah, their Savior, their Redeemer, their Sustainer, their Creator. They turned away from Him untold times. The book of Judges is a litany of the times in which the children of Israel would walk away from God. And the Bible says everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. It sounds like the day we're living in today. Everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. Do not dare lift the scripture up for them to look at because they'll say, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. This book judges you, friend. It judges me. I, I, when I read this book, I don't read this book looking for how can I judge somebody in the church. No, I read this book and I think, how is this going to judge me? Because I'm going to be judged by this book when I get to heaven. The Lord's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant based on how Stephen Kutzman measures up to this book. Right. So I'm not looking to find fault with Brother Harper. I'm not looking to find fault with anybody else in the church. I'm looking in this book to find out what can I do to get closer to Jesus, to have a relationship with Him, because I don't want to be religious and lost. I want to have relationship with Him. So... They fell so far away. 
They backslid over and over and over. They would repent and sin and repent and sin and repent and sin. They would offer the right sacrifices. If it's a turtle dove, they'd offer a turtle dove. If it, if it was a, some kind of a, sh- a lamb, they'd offer a lamb. If it was something else, they'd offer that. They would bring in their heave offerings and their wave offerings. They would do whatever it was they had to do to satisfy the commands of the law, but they were religious. They were religious in what they did. They, they were religious, but they were lost. And so into this atmosphere of time, the Lord's fury and wrath with this is, how, who wants to have a relationship with somebody that treats you like that? If somebody told you all the time and hurt you all the time and did things that embarrassed you or, or, or hurt you personally or financially, and we come and say, I'm sorry, and then you have the goodness of your heart because guess what? You really are a Christian. You say, you know what? I forgive you. And it goes all right for a few weeks, maybe a month, maybe a year, and they do the same exact thing thing to you and come back and then they say I'm sorry what are you going to do and you say well I forgive you and they continually do that over and over and over what kind of relationship would you have even if you could forgive them for what they did what kind of a relationship could you have with somebody that did that to you and yet the children of Israel did this to God on a continual basis and so he He has a man born by the name of Jeremiah who's about 20 years old. He says, Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And this passage alone, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. This Passage alone is a great uh, idea, a great uh, we'll look at it with an observation of understanding that God has a sanctity of life. He loves life. We are a people full of life. He does not want death. He does not want destruction. He wants life in everybody from the womb forward. And so the church is responsible to help people from the cradle of the from the cradle to the grave. That's what we're doing every day, helping them because we believe in the sanctity of life that every soul matters and every soul has a purpose and every soul has a direction. And he looked at this man Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, before you were even born, before you were even formed in the belly, I got a plan for you. Jeremiah did what Moses did. See, Moses, when he was called, he said, Lord, I can't do the job. I don't want to do it. Uh, I can't even speak. I I stutter all the time, and I just can't do it. Uh, We think he stuttered, but he said, I can't do the job. And so the Lord said, "Uh, you're going to do the job, Moses. This is the same thing he says to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, Lord, I'm young. I cannot speak. I'm but a child. And the Lord says, he says, don't say you're too young, Jeremiah, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. Listen, if you are a true man and woman of God, get it in your head. If God tells you to do it, do it. He had a job to do, Jeremiah. He was going to be a prophet, this son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah was a priest, perhaps a high priest. He was going to be in line to be a priest himself, but God called him to be a prophet. A prophet for the exile. A prophet that would not introduce to Israel, to the nation of Judah, that would not introduce them to this God as a Savior. No, he was going to introduce them to God as a judge. A judge. A judge. It goes against everything we know about him. God is Savior. Uh, He forgives me. He sanctifies me. He redeems me. Uh, It doesn't matter how far, and we say it, and it's true, it doesn't matter how far you walk away from God, Brother Robin, God will pull you back. All you got to do is repent of your sins and come to him. But then he says here that God is going to use this exile to push them out of the land of Judah to judge them for their sin. And so Jeremiah sorrows and he laments, he grieves, he even lives in a state of depression at times and he deals with this loss 
that he sees all around him. Why? Because somewhere along the way, these covenant people, they lost sight of their relationship with God and simply followed him without any heart in what they were doing. They followed him. They obeyed the rules, but their lips were speaking great words. But the Bible says their heart was far from him. You see, they knew what to do, but they didn't know how to do. They knew the exact offering to give, but they didn't know how to give the heart. You need to learn to trust God with everything. My favorite scripture says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. If you don't know what you're doing or which way you're going or what the future holds, just trust in the Lord. I've been, tr- I've been trusting the Lord now for almost 50 years serving Jesus. Uh, 43 years, not, I'll give me, not quite that old yet, 43 years serving Jesus. I've been trusting God. I've been walking with Jesus day by day. I've had my ups, I've had my downs, but all along the way, He's been there as my Savior. And then there's been times that He's chastised me as my judge. He says, Steve, you've gone too far now. And I begin to feel guilty. I begin to see that things didn't add up in my life that need to add up. Why? Because sin was present in me. And I had to do right. So here's Jeremiah. He sees Jerusalem fall. He sees the temple destroyed. He sees the best and the brightest of the young men and the beautiful women taken and stolen out of the land and driven off to Babylonian exile. He sees all that and what's left are the people that you don't really want to be around. You know what I'm saying? And so he's looking at all this thing. What's going on? And he's lamenting. He's depressed about it. He's even told by God, don't marry anybody in the land of Judah, Jeremiah, because if you do, your daughters are going to die. Your sons are going to die. Your wife is going to die. You cannot and should not marry anybody here. Here's a man who is in the prime of his life, has everything going for him. And God says, don't you dare marry Jeremiah, because if you do, you're going to bring on something worse to yourself than you ever thought imaginable. How much worse could it be to lose your children and to lose your wife because you disobeyed the word of God? I want to tell you tonight, be careful the things that you do in your flesh and the things that you do of your own mind and accord and ask God every time, God, is this what you want me to do? So Jeremiah, that would make you depressed 20-some years old. Don't you dare marry. Because if you do here in this land, this land of Judah, they're going to die. And every time Jeremiah opened his mouth, Brother Edney, the people turned against him. Every cotton pick in time. Every time. He, he prefigures Christ as a suffering servant. His family came against him. His friends came against him. Kings persecuted him. The prophets, false prophets, came against him. In fact, at one time he was thrown into a pit, in the, uh, in, uh, the pit down at the hole in the pit. And if you understand how the jails and the prisons were at that time, those dungeons, they would have floors and layers of floors. And what they would do is have a center hole. And in that hole of each floor at the bottom was a pit that they cleaned out once in a while. That's where all the refuse went. And they didn't have bathrooms like we have today. So you know what was falling on the head of Jeremiah. That's why Jeremiah got upset. That's why he said, I'm not going to speak in the name of the Lord anymore. Because he said, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. It was not the Holy Ghost that was like a fire shut up in his bone. It was the Word of God that was like a fire shut up in his bones. His Word. That's why when a man of God or a woman of God gets a Word of God for the people of God, it consumes them. It becomes like a fire burning inside them, and they have to deliver it. And Jeremiah was saying, I'm not going to do that anymore because these people are so backslidden. 
They don't even want to listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth. One time he gave a prophecy to a king. The king had it read to him. Then he took a pen knife and cut a leaflet out and threw it in the fire. He read the next page. They cut it with a pen knife and threw it in the fire. They didn't care. The word of God did not mean anything to them. It had lost its preciousness to them. But in the midst of this environment of destruction and disappointment, of heartache and hurt, Fear and frustration. Jeremiah writes a prophecy of hope and a healing from the Lord. He says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. God did it. It wasn't the Babylonians that did it. It wasn't Marduk, the God of the Babylonians that did it. It was Jehovah God of Judah. That did it. He said, I have caused them to be carried away from Jerusalem into Babylon. And when you get there, he said, Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives of your sons, and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. I mean, I'm, I'm, if I'm Jeremiah, I'm a little ticked off at this point. He told me not to marry because if I stay in Judah, Guess what? My kids and my wife are going to die. But he's telling everybody else, you going into ex- in the Babylonian exile, go ahead and get married. Plant gardens. Build homes. Have a great time while you're there because you're going to be there for 70 years, he goes on to say in the prophecy. And while you're there, pray for the peace of the city that you're in because you want to live in peace. And so pray for peace there so that you'll have peace. And then he says this, that after that 70 years period, he says, I'm going to bring you back from Babylon. And then he says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, say, for Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I haven't sent you into exile. I haven't judged you to not give you no hope. No, I have sent you there. I have great thoughts for you. I have a great future plan for you. It's thoughts of peace and not of evil. I want to give you an expected end. Something good is just around the corner. And when that happens, it says, you're going to call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. He was saying, listen, this covenantal stuff, this religious stuff, it ain't working no more. You're really going to come out of this captivity? You're really going to come out of this time of judgment when you seek me with your whole heart. Don't bring me a lamb. Don't bring me some sacrifice. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in relationship with you. That's what he's saying. I want you. I don't want the lamb. I don't want the cakes that you bring. I don't want the heave offering. I want you, every bit of you, spirit, soul, and body. And the Bible says that we are complete in Jesus Christ if we give all of ourselves to Him. Deliverance for them was there. It was a return to Him. If they would leave the religious aspect to the side, because many of them were religious, but they're lost. And for all of you who love the Lord Jesus Christ, He wants relationship with you. Oftentimes, we are religious and we're lost. We're religious because we we know what time to come to church. We know how to dress for church. We know what songs to sing at church. Believe it or not, we know what songs to sing that you like. And we know which one's going to get you standing up and clapping your hands. We become religious. And sometimes we're lost because we get into the form and the function and the ritualism of the situation, but we forget that our heart is far from Him in the process. God, forgive me if I've ever gotten in a pulpit to sing a song of praise and my mind wasn't on Jesus. God, forgive me if I ever came to the house of God and I just was going to fill a slot knowing this is my obligation. It's not about obligation. If you stay in a marriage because you're obligated to it, you need to do that, okay? I'm not saying don't do that. Stay in your marriage. But how much happier is that relationship going to be if it's not just about obligation, but it's about love and relationship? 
Listen, if I went home and didn't go and speak to my wife and went to bed three or four days in a row, I'd hear about it about the fifth day. I might hear about it before that because it's about relationship. So the problem is we, we treat God like some kind of a celestial Santa Claus. Jesus, I've sinned. Please forgive me. We confess our sins. But we don't confess to change. We just confess to relieve our guilt. That's religious. It's about, that's religion. It's not relationship. When you repent and you confess your sins, it says to confess and forsake your sins. So we have a bag of sins that we carry around. We put our sins in there. Boom, I did this, I should have done this. I did that, and I start feeling guilty. And so eventually that bag of sins gets so full, and I still feel so guilty. I say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And guess what Jesus does? Every time he forgives you. But that's not the relationship that he wants with us. We get into this routine of just confessing our sins, but our repentance has nothing to do with change. It just has to do with about feeling better about ourselves. It's coming in the house of God. I, I feel guilty about my week, and so I'm, I'm going to say, Jesus, forgive me. And, and I might speak in tongues for two or three minutes or more, but then I'm going to go right back out in two or three days. I'm going to do the same exact thing I did that got me in that situation the first time because I didn't repent with, this, with the idea of, of changing my life. This is what Israel did. This is what Judah did. They were religious, but they were lost. Because they forgot about the one. They, Jeremiah said, you've made a great sin. You've, you've, you've rejected me, the fountain of living waters. And you've hewn out for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You have out of you, if you have the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. They're flowing out of you. Why would you take that and put it in a cistern? Where there's no fresh water. It becomes stagnant. And on top of that, it's broken. It can't even hold the water of the Holy Ghost. You need to walk tonight in the flow. Let the Holy Ghost flow out of you. Let God's Spirit flow out of you. And that flow is a result of relationship. Not of religion. And while I'm at it, we are not a denomination. I get so tired. I'm getting one where I shouldn't go here. I'm so tired of people calling us a denomination. A denomination is a part of the whole. We are not a part of the whole. We don't trace our origin back to the Athanasian Creed or, uh, creed or, 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 or the, uh, the Creed of uh, Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea. We don't go back to the Theodosius Code. We don't go back to all that stuff. We chase our origin right back to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when they were all with one accord and one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting and they began to speak with tongues as God's Spirit gave the utterance and then Peter preached a message. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That is where we trace our origin. That is the womb and the matrix of the church. Not some man-made creed. I called a priest one day when I was in college. I had a hard time calling him father, but I did be respectful. I asked him, what do you teach as a plan of salvation? He said, we teach uh, the apostolic tradition of the third century. I said, the third century? He said, yes, the third century. Well, you and I both know when the church was born. It wasn't born in the third century. This thing was born in the first century. Jesus Christ was born, and the entire calendar changed. That was the first century. And so what he was saying was, we're based, salvation comes through the Catholic Church. I shouldn't be using religious groups. I'm sorry about that, but it doesn't come through that. It comes from that Acts 2 experience on the day. We're not religious. We have a relationship with him. 
Because when they began to speak with other tongues, the Spirit of God chose to dwell in their temple. He made their body the temple of the Holy Ghost. For he says, know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? What he wanted to do way back under Moses when he gave them the law and gave them the tabernacle and said, uh, let my people go, Pharaoh, so they may worship me. I want to dwell in the midst of my people. He dwells in the midst of his people now because he dwells inside of you. And how much sadder is it for the Holy Ghost to be dwelling in us and we develop this strain of religiosity. They lost their connection. And so Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11, will you still murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not? They don't, you don't even have a relationship with those gods, but you're going after them. And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even as I have seen it, saith the Lord. Here it appears that Jeremiah is listing the Ten Commandments, but not in the order that we read them earlier, beginning with the fact that there's one Lord. No, he starts from the end. He starts with those things that have to do with relationship with other people. God is interested in whether or not you have right behavior toward other people. If you're in right relationship with others, that is an indication of your true covenantal position in Christ by how I treat my neighbor. Do I love my neighbor as myself? They asked him, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If I don't love my neighbor, it's an indication that I don't really love God. And I certainly don't love myself. And so this is the relationship that he's dealing with here, is that you want to be in right relationship with God, you need to make sure that you are treating your neighbor. It's more important to treat your neighbor right, and it's more important to understand that's a clear indicator of where your real walk with God is. If you can't stand to look at your neighbor in the church house, how can you stand to look at your neighbor with God? Jesus said, if you say you love, your, if you say you love me but you hate your neighbor, you're lying. How can you love your how can you love me whom you have not seen, but not love your neighbor who you see every day? It's about relationship. It's not just about relationship with Jesus. That's a part of it. It's an important part. But my relationship with Jesus mandates my relationship with you. And if all the time I'm doing this, I'm also confessing sins that I don't even intend to change over. I've become religious, but I've become lost. I heard a man say recently, Harold Hoffman of all people, he said that God is a God of completion, not of competition. Do not let competition be named among us. Now, I know we're in the gold and silver campaign. I'm not talking about that. And I hope gold wins. Thank you. But I'm not, it's not about competition. I learned a long, I learned a long time ago, if I know who I am in Jesus, I don't got to compete with nobody else. I learned a long time ago, if my identity is in him, no man can give me my identity. I got my, my identity from Jesus Christ. I'm his child. I'm his son. I'm also... In another sense, he's part of the bride of Christ. I'm a part of the body of Christ. He's the head of the body. I mean, if you, be, you take the time to read the Bible, you're going to find there's so many symbols in there. At the end of the day, it's just about relationship. Everything in it is about relationship with him. Not about religion. Not about doing rote ritualism. But instead, having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ. And like the pastor said this morning, the best way to do that is to read your Bible, to pray every day, and to treat people right. If you speak in tongues all day long, 
but you don't know how to treat your neighbor right, then you're religious, but you're lost. I don't want to be religious and lost. That's why I come to Jesus. I'm asking tonight to search your hearts. I know I'm speaking to wonderful people that love Jesus. You wouldn't be here if you didn't love him. But I'm asking you, as I begin to close right now and to get a song ready, I'm asking you, when you come to this altar tonight, search your heart. Find a place to kneel and pray and say, Jesus, have I been religious? Have I just confessed sins because I felt guilty but had no intention of changing my ways? If I have, Jesus, I'm sorry, and I want to change, God. I want to change. And get to know Him better than you do right now. Sometimes we have relationships with people, and it's like an acquaintanceship. We know them, but we don't really know them. Don't let Jesus be an acquaintance. Get to know Him. Have a relationship with Him. Treat other people right, and you'll please Him. And you'll have a great relationship with the Lord. So God brought them back out of captivity. He brought them into the land of promise again. They were exiled from the land of promise. Don't let that be said of us. That somehow we had been living in the land of promise. We had God's pleasure upon us. And because we became religious, we became lost. And we lost all that. And we're exiled away from it. Instead, come back to Jesus. Go back to the place where he first found you. And you made that first commitment. And say, Lord, I'm renewing that commitment tonight. Stand with me tonight. Will I surrender all? Would you come to the altar tonight? Would you find a place to pray? Jesus, I don't want to be religious and lost. I, I want to call out to you, God. I, I don't want every time I come to pray, it's just because I feel bad. But I want to make a change. I want to do right, Jesus. I want to live righteous, holy, and godly in this present world, Jesus. I surrender all. Well, let's find a place to pray, folks. Let's just, if you need to sit down, sit down at your pew and talk to Jesus. Just let him know, I, I love you, Jesus. I still love you after all these years. I, I still want to be close to you, Jesus. I'm still calling out to you, Jesus. My heart, God, is still indicting a good matter. I worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I surrender all. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I surrender all.
Oh uh-huh. 